The last image review session that we did was all the way back in November of 2021. This is going to be the core ultrasound image review episode number 20. Now, what we do here is we just kind of go through clips. There's very rarely any kind of rhyme or reason for why we're doing certain clips. It's just great clips that we've seen, and we just want to do little tiny tidbits of information that we think are super high yield when using point of care ultrasound at the bedside. Check it out. Okay, now, do you know this has a name? Do you know what this is? I've only seen it once. I've literally only seen it in this case. It's a collar button abscess. It's like a specific abscess that's in a specific spot and it goes through and like their fingers are stuck out. So yeah, you know, we talked about soft tissue infections already. Do you think this needs an ultrasound to diagnose as an abscess? No. I mean, right, you can see the pus. You can see the pus actually draining. We don't need ultrasound for this. This looks pretty painful though, right? You can imagine how painful this would be. Yeah. So in this case, I'm gonna be using my ultrasound to try and alleviate suffering. Um, now there's a specific nerve block that is was perfect for this. Do you have any idea what that nerve block would be? What's the, what's the distribution of the sensory distribution of this part of the hand? That'd be like the median nerve, right? All right, so the median nerve is actually gonna be right here in the middle of the forearm. And, and you can go in uh, out of plane, like have the transducer here and then have the needle come in like that. You definitely can do that. Uh, but you can also do this in the long axis. So right here we have, so this uh, transducer is on the uh, outside right here, um, the anterior forearm transverse. These are the superficial flexors. Here are the deep flexors of the form. And this guy sitting all by himself, this is that median nerve. And I like doing these blocks in the long axis, uh, if I can, um, just because you can see the needle, you have really good visualization here. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm using that needle and I'm doing little kind of injections here uh, of anesthetic and really trying to get a nice little like donut around um, that nerve. You don't wanna poke the nerve, especially if you happen to be using a cutting needle, which in of itself is probably not the best, uh, especially when you're starting out, because you, you don't wanna accidentally like cut um, that nerve and the cutting needles, obviously they cut. It's better to use a blunt needle, um, such as the nerve block needles that we have. But you can see here that I'm being very diligent and very slow with my movements to try and get a nice pocket all the way around uh, that median uh, nerve. And here I'll just fast forward a little bit, you can see here, I'm getting a nice donut all the way around that. Now you don't have to do this when you're doing nerve blocks. You don't have to do a donut per se, uh, because if you just put it on one side of the nerve, eventually all of the anesthetic will like diffuse through uh, that nerve and actually be in there. But um, if you really want there to be a faster onset, highly would suggest getting a donut. And usually what I do with the forearm ones is I'll go deep first, inject about half of it deep, and then back up, redirect, and then go uh, more superficial and then go on top of it to create that donut versus like the, I guess, croissant of just putting it on one side. Cool beans? How, how distal or how proximal do you go in the forearm? That's a great question. Um, so I usually go mid forearm. Obviously, like it just depends on what other structures are around, but most of the forearm blocks, I'm actually gonna be doing them at least mid forearm for a couple of reasons. So the main reason is that um, there's superficial and kind of deep little perforator branches of these nerves, right? And the closer you get to the wrist, the more of those have like branched off. So if you really wanna get a dense block at the hand, the more proximal you are in the form, the better of a block you're gonna get most of the time because you're, you've gotten it basically at the more of the kind of, it's not the right word because the trunks are up here, right? But it's more on the trunk of the nerve rather than after like the branches have already started coming off. Second thing is that the farther away you get from the hand, the less painful it's actually going to be. You just got to think about like the homunculus, right? Um, how the hand has like very high innervation. The wrist still kind of hurts a bit. And as you move into the form, it hurts a lot less. And then this is not the case for the median nerve, but for the ulnar and the radial um, at the wrist, um, they're actually right next to those arteries. But as you move uh, proximally, the artery and the nerve actually split off and you can just focus on the anesthetic on the nerve. So it's probably safer and you're less likely to A, cut the artery on accident and B, accidentally put anesthetic within the artery, which you don't wanna do either of those things. All that to say, mid form or more proximal is usually where I'm doing my injections. Cool? Cool. Sweet. All right, 
What do I have here? Let me give you a hint. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, patient with a uterus, and they have, and I'm looking at their uterus. Would that be PID. Okay, could be. So you're, th you're thinking like infection then? Yeah. Okay. Look at the shadowing. What can you tell me about that shadowing? Is it a dirty shadow of gas, or is it a is it a, a full kind of dark shadow? Maybe it's calcification. Yes, in the setting of fibroids. So not all fibroids can get calcified, but if you have like severe and they've been there for a while, they can actually calcify like this. You can see the whole uterus itself is quite enlarged. Um, this patient had a history of fibroids, but came in with pain and we are trying to figure it out. So I uh, found this and it's just to know what fibroids look like on ultrasound. Not not typically what we look at, um, but you know, that's, that's the great thing about ultrasound. We can basically look at whatever we want, right? All right, this is in the chest. I'm quizzing you. Patient comes in with a cough and a fever. So this, I'm seeing, so I'm seeing a lot of what looks like subcutaneous gas. Um, okay. Yep. Given the fact that it's like hyperchoic, mm -hmm. uh, you don't see like the, the, the shadowing is different. You're right. Yeah. You're so right. Um, uh, and as part of this is my fault is I didn't really give you any other hints. This is gas, right? These are little like bits of gas with dirty shadowing deep to it. But this is in a more or less uh, physiologic location. This is actually a pneumonia. So this is actually um, a pneumonia. These are bronchograms, which bronchograms, you know, have air in them, which creates that kind of shadowing. And I love that you already knew because that's honestly, that's sometimes what we struggle with. We actually sometimes struggle with um, being uh identifying an abnormality, then really understanding what the abnormality means, right? So this right here is, if we were looking uh, in the contralateral side, which I don't have that image, um, we would see rib, rib, pleural line, and a shadow, uh, sorry, and a, and a artifact, A-lines deep to it. But once you actually start to see actual tissue of lung, which that's what we're seeing here, anytime you see that, it's always abnormal. You should never see lung tissue on ultrasound. And most of the time, when you see this much of a consolidation, it is from pneumonia. It, it could be atelectasis, theoretically speaking, totally could be. Uh, but most of the time, um, if it's this bad, it's going to be uh, a pneumonia. Because remember, atelectasis is, is a compressed lung, right? So you have a compressed lung, there's less air in it, more and more tissue kind of concentration. So it can look similar, but usually not, usually not this bad. I'm going to take a brief pause here just to let you know that all of our content is on the coreultrasound.com website. That is Ultrasound Podcast, 5 Minutes Sono, Ultrasound of the Week, Clip Bank, and we also have our courses page where we have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals and Core Ultrasound Question Bank where you have 3,200 questions with feedback including narrated videos explaining the question. Check it out and back to your video. All right, so this is lung. It's labeled right apex of the lung. Um, this is a rib with a rib shadow. This is that pleural line. What do you think this is right here? Right here? That little hypoechoic little thing right here. So this is the pleural line, and we're seeing a break of the pleural line right here. Any idea what that could be? Break of the pleural line? Yeah, it's like a little dip. It's darker here, which means that it's probably tissue or fluid. Yeah. Could that potentially be like a bleb? So a bleb won't, a bleb is air filled, right? So we're not gonna actually see tissue with a bleb because a bleb is basically, you have the, the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. Um, so normal parietal pleura, visceral pleura, um, and then there's air deep to it, right? And with a bleb, you still have the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, but the tissue is completely destroyed. So you still have like an air-filled cavity, but there's no lung tissue there at all. Um, this is what we call a subpleural consolidation. And that actually can be present in the setting of uh, a lot of things, but especially, you know, from 2020 until now, um, the most common cause, and I don't have data to support this, just what I see in clinical practice. This is a viral pneumonia. That's what they look like. It could be a, it could be an early bacterial pneumonia because they all have to start somehow. 
Um, and I know that this is very likely an infection because you see how there's a bunch of bee lines. Like you see one over here, you'll see like a little sliver of a bee line over here. It's actually probably a bit more of tissue consolidation over here. The fact that I have an inflammatory process around it, which if you see bee lines instead of an infection, that's due to increased density in the setting of inflammation and infection, right? So if you see a little like black kind of like circle underneath the pleural line, with surrounding B lines, it's very likely an inflammatory subpleural consolidation. And the most common cause of that will be a viral pneumonia. So this is basically how we diagnose COVID on ultrasound. Got it. Make sense? Yep. All right, this patient came in uh, after an MBC. This is liver. This is the diaphragm. Now, what are we seeing up here? What is that? What is that, what is that jiggly boy? Is that a pleural fusion? It is. It definitely is. But why is this so jiggly? Is that the lung? It's actually clot. The lung yeah. usually has a nice little like border around it. Um, and it doesn't jiggle so much. It's actually like it, you can see it kind of move a bit with a diaphragm. But this is actually what clot looks like. Yeah. Cool. What is going on here? This is a thoracic cavity. What are all these like squiggly things? Any idea? At the thorax. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at lung or are we? Yeah. So this is this is actually lung down here. These squiggly things are like little basically uh, fibrin strands, which you can see it in the setting of a, a complicated uh, pleural effusion, an empyema, or a kind of fibrosis type picture if someone's had a chronic effusion. Got it. Yeah, I was wondering if they look almost like septated. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is one that, you know, we found on image review. So I don't know the exact clinical like story behind it. But if the patient came in super sick, like this could be definitely an empyema because of the loculations. All right. Um, now this patient, this is an eyeball, and they came in with sudden painless uh, monocular vision loss. Do you, uh, do you see a retinal detachment? Not an obvious one when I'm looking. I don't. What do you see right in the middle of that optic nerve sheath? Uh, it's like a hyperechoic dot. So yeah. It's making me think of like a, a, the uh, artery, artery occlusion, central retinal artery. Yes, bingo. That is a central retinal artery occlusion. Um, and this is not common that we pay, that we like have a whole lot of like multi, you know, multi-institution randomized controlled trials with regards to the, um, the accuracy of ultrasound. But if you see this and the patient has the symptoms of it, be suspicious, um, of a, um, of a CRAO or a central retinal artery occlusion. And this right here is called the retro bull bar spot sign. Cool beans. This one, I feel like bread and butter. What do you see? What are we looking at? Oh, you tell me. Look at the depth. So it's quite deep, 15 centimeters. It's pulsatile. Oh, uh, is this a uh, aorta? Yeah, this is a huge triple A. Um, there's probably, so this is uh, the actual like, um, blood flow area. This is all clot. And sometimes, I don't know if I'd call this an actual dissection uh, because what's probably happening is the there's some blood going around the clot itself, almost like dissecting the clot rather than a true dissection. What's that? So you, like this doesn't look like a true like flap? No. Yeah, it doesn't like the, the typical presentation of one. Um, usually it's like a solid kind of white squiggly line going from one side to the other. Um, so I think this is just probably clot, the clot being dissected rather than the, the, the intima being dissected. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We talked about this one already. Isn't that fun? Yeah, this looks like it's like cellulitic, but then it's also just fluid. So I'm guessing an abscess. Yeah, this is that postostalsis that we talked about, right? You squeeze it, you see kind of squish back and forth. That is uh, more predictive of an abscess. All right, see if you can identify the abnormality here. This is an apical four-chamber view. We have the left side of the heart over here. We have the right side of the heart over here. What are we seeing? 
Um, so it looks the right side of heart looks bigger to me mm -hmm. than the left side of the heart. Absolutely. So right heart as a whole looks bigger than over here. Good. What else do we see? So I'm seeing some. Sh I'm wondering. There's like a booger in the valve too. Yes, and I love that you called it a booger. That's exactly what I think about it. There is a booger in that valve. That is endocarditis. You actually see that flaily thing right there. There's a small sliver of a pericardial effusion right over here, which you can actually see. And then just for like sake of completeness, um, we can look at the ejection fraction over here and the ejection fraction looks pretty good. So normal systolic function, normal, um, not depressed at least. Uh, enlarged right heart and a small pericardial effusion. Put color flow on there quite a bit of regurg, right? There's just like a gaping hole because this patient actually had like a, essentially a flail tricuspid valve, which is no bueno. Now, I don't know if you've seen one of these yet. I know we're, we're kind of early in our EM career, um, but any idea what we're seeing here? It's a femoral well, it looks vein. Looks like a vessel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Femoral vein it, right here. It looks like you're trying to compress it, but it's not compressible. So yeah. I'm guessing a DVT. It is. It's a femoral vein DVT. This is the uh, femoral artery, another femoral artery down here as it splits into the superficial and the deep femoral artery. And we're seeing a pretty big DVT in there. Um, now this one right here, I didn't do this. Um, if you, this is one on image review. If you actually see hyperechoic material on the inside, you don't necessarily need to compress, honestly. Um, uh, because if you see it, it's there. You compress if it's like a fresher clot, because sometimes there can be a clot in there, but it's not that hyperechoic and you might not necessarily see it. Um, but any borderline cases, um, make sure that you try that compression to look at it. Just once you do it, like make sure you record the images because it's um, kind of like a case reportable thing, but it's it's essentially not a lot of risk, but it's something that I always think about that there have been cases of PEs uh, that happen after a DVT examination. So I, I basically, once I identify these, I just, I don't like bring the resident in there, bring the medical student all to like do this examination, do it once, record it, and then show, hey, here's how it looks but I don't do it again. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but we can actually confirm placement of a central line in the right place just by using our ultrasound. We don't need, really need yeah. an x-ray. Are you familiar with this? I did it yesterday with oh. uh, Steel and Edo. Nice. Um, so if you inject it in the red port, and this is subclavian or IJ, if you inject, and honestly you can do it with femoral as well, but that's, that's where most of the data is. If you inject into the red pore, just like a big push of a syringe of something, some places actually use the patient's own blood and then like they'll, they'll aspirate the blood and then push it back. And if you see turbulence within two seconds um, in the right uh, side of the heart, which has what we're seeing over here, this is a peritoneal long axis view. We have the left atrium, the left ventricle, the aorta out there. And then right here, we have the right side of the heart. Watch this. Yeah. So if we see this, you see how like basically like almost like opacified, almost like there's contrast in there now. If you see that within two minutes of pushing uh, whatever it is that you decided to push, either saline, agitated saline or um, blood, um, that confirms that it is in the appropriate location, the SVC. Make sense? Yep. More kind of bread and butter stuff. What do you see here? Liver? Liver, this is gallbladder. Mm -hmm. Looks like a big stone. Yeah, big stone. And it's kind it's of in the neck, coach. huh? Yeah, the shadowing too. Yep, yep, yep. And the shadowing is actually pretty important. It helps us identify stones versus like a polyp. And this is one, kind of a similar picture, but this patient's a, a lot more diseased, right? Um, we're actually seeing some sludge over here. And this wall right here is quite thickened as well, which is another finding of cholecystitis. Um, is a thickened gallbladder wall. So that's what that looks like. We have sludge, we have a big stone that's basically impacted in the neck. That is cholecystitis. I hope that was helpful for you all. Don't forget to check out the Core Ultrasound website for our best foam ed or free open access medical education goodness. And if you want a little bit extra, check out the courses.coreultrasound.com website. We have our Core Ultrasound question bank that is 3,200 questions that we actually did video narrations for the answers. So it's not just the questions, we're actually giving you feedback. We have an amazing dashboard where you can actually track your residents, your learners' progress as they go through these questions. We can actually give you the sensitivity and specificity for that specific person diagnosing a pneumothorax. It's 
pretty sweet software. We also have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals, which is basically our intro to ultrasound course. And we have other courses on there as well, like old school castle fast new uh, sound and surf and other courses that we put together online i hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning